Uh, yeah, so thank you so much, Adam, and uh, thank you also to the organizers for the opportunity for uh, giving this keynote. Uh, my name is Flavio Brasil. Uh, some of you might remember me from last year. I was also talking about Kyo, uh, and Kyo is a new effect system in Scala. Um, and last year I had like a, the core effect system, and over the past year I've been extending the library, creating uh, new abstractions, safer abstractions as well. So today I'm finally ready to release the library. So uh, if you go to the website and it's all available already uh, there. So before diving to Kyo, I wanted to give you some backgrounds on where this library is coming from, right? So this is uh, coming from a passion of mine. Uh, so Kyo is not like my professional day job, it's really a passion project. And the question I'm always after is how can I build solutions that are simple, so they are more accessible to more people, uh, they are easier to use, right? Uh, but at the same time, they are safe, so people can make fewer mistakes when they are using those solutions. And the twist that makes it very interesting to me, because I'm a performance engineer at my day job, is how can I make those abstractions, those solutions, uh, execute with good performance? And that's a really interesting twist, right? Because as you introduce simplicity, safety, you're actually adding abstractions and it's hard to keep performance uh, with this kind of solution. And that's the thing that I like to do. So I've been doing Kyo uh, for a couple of years now uh, out of this passion, this uh, search for uh, this kind of solution. And I've worked on many projects over the years uh, in open source in Scala. This one actually many people don't know. Uh, my first project in Scala was called Activate. It was like a hibernate uh, for Scala. Uh, so not really functional. Uh, it was a part of a small talk solution I used to work with. Uh, it was an interesting thing because it's actually the simplicity, the search for the simplicity is uh, really uh, well uh, depicted here. So as you can see, you can create entities and you can like have transactions and make modifications in a very easy and simple way. And a fun fact, actually Quill was born just as a query module for Activate. So it wasn't really uh, to be a separate project, but it came, became a separate project. I also worked on the first type level validation library in Scala called Bond. Uh, it came out of my work doing some UIs and like user interfaces uh, to have better ways of doing validation. I didn't really invest much on Bond because right after someone created a very similar library, so I decided to just focus on Quill at the time. Uh, and I also developed, this is like not a complete list, uh, I worked on Clump that is similar to ZeoQuery, Hexo, Stitch, like uh, batching of uh, RPCs to other services. Uh, that was at my time at SoundCloud where we had that need. Uh, I also worked on uh, future implementation with really high performance. Uh, I think up to this date, I think it's probably the implementation with the best performance uh, available. And some of the techniques of optimization ended up landing even in the Twitter future and the standard library future as well. I also explored a lot of arrows as a way of staging computations to have better performance, right? So uh, you can have like a monadic computation, but then you stage it through arrows and you don't need to keep allocating all the steps of the computation and you can have much better performance. And some of that is actually encoded in Kyo today, uh, but arrows at the time like didn't really have a good usability, like composing arrows, it's not uh, something easy to do. Uh, I also worked, for example, on asynchronous database drivers for uh, with NDBC, uh, and probably most of you know Quill, I created Quill uh, when I was at SoundCloud as well. Uh, and it's also this question, right? So at the time we wanted to have, to allow people to express queries in a way that's uh, more convenient. So basically using Scala, safer with type checked uh, queries. But at the same time, how could I do that, all of that without having runtime overheads, right? So that's how Kyo became, sorry, Quail became uh, compile time uh, in uh, language integrated query. And it's able to basically generate queries at compile time and even rule out many of the issues that could happen during query generation as well. And there's even a feature, I don't think many people use that, but you can connect to the database at compile time and validate the queries there as well. It's a, uh, I'm searching always for this kind of like safer, easier solution, right? Uh, and the last project I work, worked on in Scala was Monadlis. Uh, that is an exploration on how to translate 
the rat syntax work uh, called like async await, but to monadic composition, right? So before monadless, I think most solutions were using uh, like uh, state machines and like uh, other more custom uh, implementations. Monad monadless tries to find like more an elegant way of doing that through monad. So basically, uh, the lift and lift becomes async await, and they can be uh, translated to uh, monadic composition. Uh, but throughout this process, I produced even more libraries that I'm mentioning today. I saw that my hobby, my passion, was actually becoming more of my worry, right? So uh, every time I would release libraries, people could get really upset, especially when you are trying to innovate around monadic uh, compositions and monads. People can get really, really upset. And then I've been in a break of open source for uh, a few years now, uh, but now I'm back uh, releasing Kyo today. So I'm really excited to be like joining the open source community again and being active again to provide solutions to people uh, for them to be able to express computation in easier, safer and faster ways. Uh, but through uh, all this process, I also had my day job, right? So uh, I've been working now a decade uh, with large scale systems. Uh, so initially at SoundCloud with uh, Scala, and then uh, Twitter, also Scala. And more recently, I joined Nubank, a large fintech, fintech in Brazil. Uh, it's the company behind Clojure. They bought uh, Cognitech, the creators of Clojure. Uh, so I've been working with more Clojure code bases recently. Uh, I delivered major performance optimizations for Finagle, uh, Twitter Future, Stitch, that is like the uh, batching library internal one at Twitter. I also had some uh, experience working on just time compilation optimizations in Graal for monadic comp compositions as well. So uh, a lot of like that came uh, as knowledge to build SQL as well. And more recently, I've been working on closure, uh, code bases, but more focused on thread scheduling, problems in container environments. I spoke at Strange Loop about this work recently as well. And I think the experience that uh, it's probably the thing that uh, brings me uh, a lot of uh, knowledge around like how to build those systems is just seeing systems crashes, right? So I've seen systems failing all sorts of way and I helped like solve many complex uh, instability issues as well. And that's like experience uh, that is very valuable to build a solution like Q. Uh, I put some highlights of a talk I gave in 2019 at Scala Matsuri uh, there. It's a, maybe if you want to watch, it's an interesting context on how uh, at the time I was trying to avoid overheads of composing monads with the Twitter future, not necessarily a monad, uh, depending on how, who you ask, uh, but basically like optimizing monadic-like computations uh, with just-time compilation. And Q is like an evolution of that work as well. So. Uh, it's an interesting talk to uh, watch as well. So throughout this process, my conclusion is that functional programming is really amazing. It's just like the best way you can do software engineering. It's the safest way. Uh, it's uh, just like the uh, you have like the right abstractions for the work that you have to do. Uh, and you can have, for example, like a runtime that doesn't have like asynchronicity. You can just put a monad there and then you can implement asynchronicity or implement many of the things that uh, would be language level, but at the user level without language changes. But at the same time, I think functional programming can be also terrible, especially the kind of systems I work with, like large scale systems, they can suffer of really deep problems. So uh, the first one is, the interpretation overheads, right? So when you are defining monads and these solutions affect systems, you're actually defining a user level interpreted language. And interpreters are a classic problem for uh, performance. Like it's really hard to have good performance with interpreters. The JVM used to be very slow with only interpreters and now it's just time compiled. And like, it's just like, the, it's like night and day, right? So um, these interpreters basically have to take like the maps and flat maps, all the operations you are doing, and then invoke them, interpret them. And that defeats a lot of the optimizations that the JVM does. Uh, so you end up with a highly dynamic execution. The JVM is not able to inline, inline things that would be in lines otherwise. Uh, it has to do invoke interface dispatches. Uh, it's a, a lot of overheads. And operating these kind of systems, uh, one of like the top problems for instability is high location rates and GC pauses, right? So 
Normally, people probably don't face uh, this problem much. At a lower scale, that manifests uh, just as cost, right? So you could have like a lower machine, a uh, smaller machine. You have to use a bigger one because you have all these overheads. But at a high scale, large systems, it becomes really difficult to operate and to make those systems stable uh, at, under pressure at a very high usage. And the other thing that makes it uh, complicated to use functional programming is just code complexity, right? So if you see more traditional uh, effect systems, uh, like the first example there, people have to know about implicits, uh, parametric polymorphism, uh, I don't know, like type lambdas, and uh, and then on top of that, they have to know how to use monads, flat and flat map, and top of that, they have to know some of like category theory concepts. It's just like too much for people to learn, right? So I don't think this is a paradigm a, a approach to programming that's going to become ever become mainstream, right? Uh, and then if you have like situations where you have to mix different uh, effects, it becomes even worse, right? Because then you have the complexity of monad transformers and on top of that monad transformers complexity, then you have a slow interpreter on top of a slow interpreter on top of a slow interpreter is just not something that uh, is usable for large scale high performance systems. Uh, and, but at the same time, these solutions have great characteristics. Like people use it because they do provide a lot of nice things, right? But I think the way that we are exposing users into those solutions and the functional programming uh, uh, paradigm, it's not ideal. And that's been holding Scala back, I think. And I think what we need is really innovation, right? And uh, a lot of my work, maybe that's why it's so contentious, because because I'm always trying to break rules, right? So I'm trying to do things in a way that was not done before. So And people normally don't really uh, like that. And we saw a major innovation a few years back that was when Zio was introduced, right? So I spoke about that last year and I'm uh, going to say again because it was really fascinating to see William and John like creating Zio and like defining the error channel, the environment channel, and then how people would say like, no, this is not going to work. This is like wrong or <laughs> et cetera, right? So the pushback of innovation as well. Uh, and to me, like Zio is the main uh, innovation in this space uh, in recent years, um, especially I think even across other languages as well. Uh, but Zio still has some things that still are uh, limitations of expressivity uh, of how you can express computations and um, the complexity that comes out of that. So, for example, if you have like a computation that has a requirements of environments but doesn't throw, you can use one type alias, or you can use task, or Rio, or UIO, or we or URO. I can't even pronounce those uh, type aliases, right? Because what is happening here? We have like a fixed type uh, sets of type parameters, and you have to adapt your computation, your requirements to one of these aliases, or you have to declare the entire zero signature, that can also become uh, uh, syntax uh, heavy, right? Uh, and when I saw zero and then over the years, I always like had, I like to take like solutions and break them apart and think, okay, what if I do this different? Or if I do this other thing and I keep experimenting with things, right? So, um, for Zio, like I had these questions, for example, do we really need a fixed RD? Why just like the environments and the error type, error type channels? Why? Is that really fundamental, right? Uh, something that I always, and that was even before Zio, was uh, I always found it strange how the effect systems, the base monad, uh, assumes that the computation can perform side effects IO and can perform asynchronously, right? Why can't we really express the base monad as something pure that might require something from the environments, apply something, but not do side effects or do asynchronicity as well? Um, and why only dependency injection, like the mechanism for the environments? Why just short circuiting? Why not have other possible types of effects? Uh, and the last one, and this is where the design space uh, of QO is, is what if we could express an unbounded number of effects, right? So what if we just unconstrain uh, the uh, the sets of effects? And that's where uh, QO is. So uh, there is the greater type uh, that is the base monads in QO. Uh, and it's a 
quite new encoding of uh, a monad. So it has very particular uh, behaviors and uh, different, uh, especially at runtime, something that is a different way of executing monads. And you're probably going to hear like it's breaking rules again. It's not doing what people expect the way they are doing today. It's a new way of doing monads on the JVM. Uh, and if you see the zero computation, you have the R as the environments, the E as the errors the computation can fail, and the A is the type that the computation is going to be producing. And what Q does is like rearrange those things. So that is using the greater type. So the A is a type that the computation is going to be producing. And then on the right, and this is the ink fix type notation, right? Uh, on the right, you have a type intersection with all the effects that the computation can perform, okay? Uh, and this is uh, something that you can't really do directly because you can't have like a intersection of a database with uh, throwable, for example. It doesn't make sense, right? So what Q does is you have effects that are going to define the behavior of each of the pending effects. So for example, uh, the AMPS effects is for getting things from the environments for the penis injection. The aborts effects is for short circuiting for the error channel uh, in Zio. And you're probably going to notice that the effects in Kyo by convention, they are the plural of what they handle. So if you have AMPS, it's for environments, aborts for aborting. So basically uh, this naming uh, pattern. And if you have, for example, a computation that doesn't require anything from the environments, you don't need another type alias. You just don't have the effect in the painting sets of uh, effects, right? So the second parameter is a set of painting effects to be handled. And in Kyo, and this is something new, uh, it's an effect system where the base monads, the greater type, actually can express pure computation. So if you have any uh, as the painting sets of effects, it means that there is no requirements nothing to be handled. So it means that this is actually a pure value. And this is what brings some of the niceties around uh, usability in Kyo, but also the runtime uh, better uh, performance that Kyo can achieve. Because internally, even though you have an A with the any and etc., internally it's just A. There isn't boxing, there isn't anything around the type. It's just the type itself within the runtime. Um, Let's see a more concrete example. Let's say that we have a computation that's going to be producing A, uh, but then it requires a database from the environments and it can fail with a database exception. So a more concrete example. Uh, as I spoke before, uh, Kyo doesn't uh, assume the computation can perform side effects. So there is another effect for IO. So IO is separate from the base monad. So if you are if you have a computation that's going to be producing side effects like using databases, you have to also declare that the computation is going to be using IOs, right? So uh, this is the kind of pattern. Um, and then if you have if you have these signatures, you can end up end up in a situation where the signatures can get very big, right? And Zero has some of that as well, uh, and because all the painting effects are in the same type level set, it's very easy to refactor things. So for example, I can just refactor uh, the requirements for databases in a new type, right? So very easily get rid of all the complexity. For example, if you have a database uh, package in your code base, you can basically define the database's uh, type alias. And then within that package, you can just reuse it without having to declare all the requirements in all the effects, right? Uh, you can also, for example, mix other uh, type aliases. For example, you can have a caches that requires a cache from the environment, can perform I.O., uh, and the A can like use databases, use caches, but you can also decide maybe every code that is going to be using databases should have access to the cache. So I can move the cache to the database type alias, right? So it becomes uh, like an algebraic uh, type level effect uh, mechanism where you can easily refactor things uh, to make your code look uh, better. And for example, you can have your definitions more advanced effect handling in a core package class, for example, and you don't need all the newcomers, everyone like really touching that code. You can keep it like separate as a more advanced code and people can have or all the niceties around like having these type aliases to avoid cluttering their codes basically. Um, 
So now I wanted to talk about, about how Q leverages Scala's type system for that, because it's, it's really unique. And I think it's a really interesting intersection of me working on these problems and performance and Scala having a really advanced type system, uh, because this is something that's not necessarily possible in other languages, for example. So if you see the second type parameter is actually a type intersection, right? So type intersections don't have an order, right? So the pending sets of effects can be ordered in any way. You can put aborts first, environments first, you can move IOs because the pending sets of effects is unordered. So if you see, there are similar solutions to Kyo, uh, for example, uh, in Haskell. And in Haskell, you have to have these effects in a specific order, and you can end up like you know, one module in one order, another module in another order. You have to handle things in the same order. And this is actually just because Haskell doesn't really have a way of expressing is an order type level sets, right? So uh, Scala's advanced type system like really brings a new design space around algebraic effects and how can, you can express uh, the requirements of a computation. Um, the original design of the greater type uh, was only Scala 3. So Q initially only had Scala 3 supports. Uh, and the implementation was so uh, opaque type, right? So the first type parameter is the type of the computation that's going to be producing. The S is the set of painting effects. Uh, and the implementation of the greater type was uh, type union, right? So it internally it would be a T, so basically the value itself or a Q. So Q, the Q type, the name Q, uh, is hidden within like the, the core of the library, so you don't uh, see it, but internally it's there. And it's basically uh, the mechanism for suspending effects and then eventually handling them. So uh, it's basically an effectful computation, not a pure value. Uh, and in Scala 2, I had implicit conversions from T with no painting effect, so T with any as a second time parameter uh, to T and back, right? So basically implicit conversions because internally there was no boxing, anything. It was just like the type itself. Uh, but then I decided to add Scala 2 so parts and Scala 3 has, even though it has some odd things like, uh, I don't know, significant dictation or things like that, uh, it has like some features that are just amazing. like and. I couldn't use them anymore. So no opaque types, no union types. Q uh, had to become, the greater time had to become a, a abstract type. And then internally I have to do casting. It's not uh, as nice as in Scala 3 only. Uh, but then if you see there is an extra T at the end there, and that's actually indicating that any type T is actually a subclass of T with no pending effects. And it's mind blowing to think like, how can like a type system can be so expressful? How can we be able to express that? And, and that's possible and that's how Q works. Uh, and that means that, for example, if you have an integer, you can uh, widen like to a effectful computation with no pending effects, right? So an integer with any is no pending effect. So basically a pure value. And then you can have the pure value back again by calling pure. You could just do a type cast and that would work because internally there is no wrapper, there's no more ads, it's just the T itself. Uh, but for safety, uh, you have to call pure basically. And then you get an integer bank. And this is part of something bigger that I call effect widening. Uh, that is the ability to pass uh, computations with fewer constraints to computations to signatures that might have a larger number of constraints. So for example, let's say we have an integer and I uh, I'm widening it to an integer with no pending effects. Uh, and then I can actually widen it to also an integer with the options effect painting. And that's because the type level sets of painting effects is a contravariant uh, type parameter. And that's again, like leveraging Scala's advanced type system, right? Uh, and you can even widen to more effects. For example, you can have, say, oh, I have a computation that has options and tries uh, potentially pending. In those, all those cases, those effects are not going to be in the computation because there is no options or try suspensions uh, in those uh, pure values. But the user then is going to have to handle those effects and handlers have like a pure version of the handler to basically lift uh, into the values that are the expected ones. Uh, and you can also widen directly from a pure value. So you can take 42, for example, and pass to a computation that uh, is declaring that can have options and tries uh, suspensions uh, effects there. 
And this enables a new way of uh, encoding fluent APIs, right? So if you are defining APIs in effect systems, you don't really have to say, okay, I'm going to have these parameters like, I don't know, a ZO, an IO. And then it's uh, the clients of that like have some trouble to basically pass values because they have to lift into the monads. Maybe the type parameters don't match. Uh, in Kill, that becomes much easier. In this example, I have an integer that can have a method that takes a uh, computation that produces an integer and can pr produce, can perform options and tries effects, right? Uh, and then I have another method that has an integer only with tries pending. And I can pass the same computation to example one, right? So it means that you can basically widen and use this mechanism for uh, making the API more fluent. And you can even pass the 42 itself. You can pass uh, integer directly because it's going to be widened to options that tries uh, by the type system itself. Uh, so that's a really interesting way because you can have like more fluent and simple APIs for users. You don't need to have like specialized versions that are effective or not. You can use the same, uh, even passing pure values to the parameters. Another thing that is interesting about Q, because uh, any type T is actually a member of the greater type, uh, there is no flat map, or if you think of it, it's actually maybe the other way around. There is no map because map and flat map in Q, they have exactly the same sig signature. Okay, so let's say that we have uh, an example method here that has two parameters. The first one is a computation that has uh, is going to produce an integer and has the options effect uh, pending or handling, and then the second one integer with tries pending. And then here I'm using flat map and I like a bit because there is a flat map there. And the purpose of the flat map method in Q is only for satisfying uh, for comprehension. So the actual recommendation is use only map. So you don't need to worry, okay, should I use a map here? Or should I use a flat map? You just use map everywhere. And I think that sounds something simple, but if you think of how people come to the language and they have to learn how to write code with these uh, abstractions, they normally have to understand, okay, what is a map? What is a flat map? And then it gets like, what is a moment? And people have trouble with that. And it's just a fact, right? If you have only map, the mental model is very simple. You have a computation and then you apply a transformation, right? So it doesn't like have all the complexities that people normally fall into in terms of concepts uh, with this uh, simplification. Uh, Kyo also has direct syntax support. Uh, in Scala 2, the implementation is basically an improved version of Monadless. Uh, Monadless was a very interesting uh, uh, experiment at the time, but it was more of, of an experiment, I would say, and I was hoping to uh, improve it. Uh, I stopped the development at the time. Um, and then on Scala 3, I couldn't really make the uh, macros in Scala 3 work. So I decided to wrap Dotty CP as async. So in Scala 3, it's just a wrapper of Dotty CP as async. Uh, and the method names I chose for async await is defer and await because in this example here, as you can see, we are using tries and options. There are no, there is no asynchronicity, right? So there's only the tries effect and the options effect. Uh, so that's why the methods I decide to go with defer and await. And as you can see, you can, for example, quote unquote, get an option, right? So get the value, get a string out of a option of string. Uh, and this is not going to be like unsafe or anything because eventually you have to handle the options effects and that's going to be short circuiting if necessary, like handling the effect properly. Uh, and then you can also do the same thing with tries and uh, I'm putting the types in the presentation and the documentation explicitly, but Scala is able to infer uh, QO computation types without issues. Um, so yeah, it's a very interesting uh, way of expressing monadic compositions, but it's not trivial to do that as well, because uh, if you have like the full support of the language within the defer method body, uh, you can end up with situations where the control flow is not clear and the transformation to map and flat map can become uh, not clear or even wrong as well. Uh, so in Kyo, uh, in, sorry, in Kyo, uh, I decided to go with a more constrained version. In Monadless, I had, okay, maybe I can support all language features. Like I was like, maybe, okay, let's just go for it and see how it works. Uh, but in Kyo, I decided to go with a more constrained version. So there are a few constraints. And the first one is, um, sorry, this is the, the sugared version. So basically like the transformation is 
if you're going to map calls. Uh, so the constraints that uh, QO has, like the first one, the most important ones, is that you cannot have an effectful computation uh, value of the greater type uh, within a deferred met method body without a wrapping a wave call. Right, so many of the mistakes you can make with this kind of transformations uh, go away with this uh, restriction break, for example. And the idea of introducing restrictions is try to mimic something like a far comprehension that is more expressive, but at the same time, it doesn't really have the entire language within, within it because more expressivity can become more ambiguity. Right? It's harder to reason and understand. So the idea of inkyo is like reducing the kind of things that you can do within a defer uh, body. And that's even for Scala 3 on top of Dodi CPS async, I basically limit what uh, Dodi CPS async can uh, support. Cool, so that's uh, the core of the library, the uh, how you transform computations, how you can uh, express computations. I'm going to do a quick rundown of uh, the effects uh, QO has, and there are many effects, so I'm not going to cover all of them, uh, but just to give you an idea. So the environment's effects uh, is similar to Zio's environment. So let's say we have a database interface, um, and then you can use the EMS effect to basically call get and summon a database out of thin air. It's a, this is mind blowing. It's a really cool, right? So it's, it's always similar as well, right? Um, and then because the computation used the AMZ effect, it's going to have a requirement that the database needs to be provided. So the effect needs to be handled in providing uh, the database. And uh, we can use the database, for example, here and mapping and then calling count. Uh, you can know this again, like the map call is going to be bundling all the effects that the computation needs, for example, environments, and then IOs from the count call. Uh, and then I can create a mock database here. And when I run and handle, so run is basically the handle methods uh, for effects. Uh, so when you call run, you can pass the database and that's going to get rid of the requirements of a database from the environment, right? So uh, you can handle each environment requirement separately uh, without uh, issues. And this is uh, more, it's a very flexible, but it's uh, it doesn't have all the features, for example, that Zio has with the Zio layers and initializing services. And that is something really cool. I'm planning eventually to have something similar as well, but even today, just this mechanism is very flexible and I've been using it uh, in more complex scenarios with a uh, good explicit, uh, you know, good way of expressing uh, requirements. Uh, the other effects I wanted to talk about is short circuiting, that is a BART, uh, similar to Zio's uh, a BART channel, error channel. Uh, the underlying type of, type of the BART's effect is actually an either, uh, and it's right by it, so you can get, quote unquote, get an either, uh, and you are going to get, for example, say, uh, actual integer there, because you are passing a write. Uh, and I'm using string for the bar, a bar. It's, uh, it's not really an exception, right? So, but it's just as an example. Uh, or you can pass left to short circuit. Uh, you can also use fail to short circuit with an error message, actually with a value. Uh, or you can ev even use catching that is going to catch exceptions within a computation. And the computation there can actually uh, have effects. So it can be also an effectful uh, computation. And it's going to be catching the effects, uh, the exceptions properly as well. Uh, Kyo also has resources for handling uh, closing resources, using them, and then eventually closing. Uh, let's say we have a database. Uh, we can acquire this database. And that's going to produce a computation that has the database, but then a requirement that re the resources effect needs to be handled. Uh, it's also very similar to Zio, and I'm going to keep repeating that because Zio is a major inspiration, inspiration for Kyo. Um, and then uh, you can handle the resources effects and handling the resources effects with run uh, means actually execute the entire computation, gather all resources that were acquired and then close all those resources at the end of the computation. Uh, the list effect is uh, very interesting as well. I'm actually quite impressed by it. I've been using Q in the uh, in link for language, large language model interactions at my day job. Uh, and list is really amazing because 
what it allows it you is to explore multiple paths, multiple choices, and then start dropping them at arbitrary points of the computation. Uh, initially, I had these uh, effects called choices, uh, because that's how uh, algebraic effect systems are really call uh, these effects. But I decided to go with lists because I'm always thinking what is like the easiest name for people to understand and like use the the, the library. So I renamed to list uh, recently. But uh, if you see, you can do lists for each. Uh, taking a list of a list of integers and then that gets you a computation that has integer as the type that's going to be produced but then has the lists effect pending right so you're basically moving the effect from the value level to the effect handling level at the, in the type parameter uh, and then you can do map and flat map like you can do regular composition and it's interesting because the execution is very uh, efficient you don't have like the issue with a list and then doing map and map and not those maps not being fused it's all within the monadic execution without like all the issues the performance issues you might have like iterating or transforming lists uh, in general. And you can also short circuit uh, items from uh, what's being evaluated. So for example, I can say drop if the value is greater than two. And at this point, during the, the execution, Q is going to see, okay, at this point, there is this drop, it's not true, and it's going to drop the current elements and the computation is going to be halted at that point. Um, halted just for that element. The other elements are going to be continue uh, being processed. Uh, this is another example here. Uh, it's using list.drop. Um, and it's just like, see, see the example, take all ones, transform them into 42, and then drop any other elements. Um, and if you think of it, you can have the for each at a much higher level of your application. And then you can have like deeply nested branching of codes. And then you can drop if, drop items at arbitrary points of the compu computation. And you can have even effects uh, between like the lists as well. So you can have like fibers or things in uh, asynchronous. Uh, and that becomes like really powerful because you can like at any point drop one thing that you are evaluating at that point. And then at the end, uh, there is a list run that is basically handling the effects. And here with the list effects, it's more clear the effect rotation mechanism. Uh, as you can see, like initially with for each, we moved the list from the value level to the uh, pending effects. And then with run, we are taking the list from the value, the pending effects to the value level, and then getting a list back. Uh, Q also has green threads, so uh, fibers, um, and they are a complete implementation with cancellation, preemption, uh, even a scheduler that is uh, very interesting because it's based on some of my work with adaptive thread pools. So it has an adaptive policy for the number of threads. Um, but he here's how you can use fibers. So you call init uh, to initialize a fiber and start executing them. It's uh, still lazy because the IO's effect is going to be uh, pending for handling. So it's not going to be actually launching a fiber at this point. Uh, but logically, it's basically starting a fiber with, for that computation. Uh, and then you can quote and quote again, get a fiber that is similar to like you could could have like a future get, but it's non-blocking, right? So the fibers effect is going to be pending. And then when you handle the fibers effect, the asynchronous chaining uh, callback phase is going to be produced without ever blocking an actual uh, fiber, an actual thread. Um, fibers also have methods like parallel for executing things in parallel. Uh, and it also has race, for example, and has the behaviors that you would expect from uh, effect system, for example, in race, the first effect that finishes is going to be the result, and all other effects, all other uh, computations are going to be uh, canceled, interrupted at that point. And Kyo uses interruption as the name for cancellation uh, at this point. Uh, something interesting about fibers in Q is that is it doesn't need the fibers don't need to cooperate for it to be preempted. Q is able to preempt a computation, a fiber at any point of the computation. So you don't need to keep call, call like EUs or other things. It's going to be automatic on any transformation. Q is able to pause the computation to the preemption and keep latencies low. Uh, another thing that is uh, a new uh, uh, module is an uh, integration with STTP to make HTTP requests. And I thought it was an interesting one to show because 
a common discussion is like, oh, how complex it is to make requests, right? So you have to set up all those things. And it's common to have libraries that you have to set up lots of things to do, uh, HTTP requests with Q and STTP. STTP is already a great library, very simple, very uh, interesting. Uh, but Kyo simplifies it even further. And the way that you do make requests is just like you can you use the request methods and then you pass a builder. And this is this builder is basically building STTP requests. So it's the STTP API at that point. Uh, and then it's going to return like the computation with the request effect pending. And then you can just handle that and you're going to get a string, right? So very simple way like of expressing computations and for example doing http http requests but the simplicity can come with like cost right so what if i can't really customize things but you can still customize things so sttp has some configurations for example for timeouts and etc in its request definition as well uh, but q also allows you to customize the back end so for example if you are in a test you can have a uh, mocked uh, backends for um, uh, the testing, for example. And then you can pass uh, that backend when you're handling the request effects. And there are many other effects, so I'm not going to explain all of them. So, but locals for scope to values, aspects in Q are pretty interesting because they are first value, first class values. So you can pass them around and the scoping becoming really powerful that way. Uh, there's auctions, tries, consoles, clocks, randoms, loggers, stats, queues. The queues one is uh, cool because it's uh, using GC tool, JC tools. That is a really high performing queue uh, implementation on the JVM. Uh, and it has even like more ex relaxed access policies, like multiple consumers, simple consumers, like it's a pretty interesting uh, solution for our good performance. Uh, the channel implementation in Q is also uh, new encoding, a new way of implementing channels. It's it's in, it's mind blowing how simple it is and the performance characteristic characteristics uh, that it has, as you can, are going to see in some benchmarks. There's also hubs. Uh, similar to Zio, uh, meters are basically for limiting computations like rate limiting or semaphores or mutex, basically anything that limits uh, computation. Uh, timers, latches, atomics, adders, caching as well, using caffeine and memoized functions. So it's a quite complete uh, effect system. There are two uh, other effects I couldn't release, uh, didn't have enough time to finish by the release today, uh, that is, uh, Tapir, HTTP, and, and uh, HTTP server uh, based on Tapir. Uh, and the other one is a new module, and that's the one that I'm, I'm more ex most excited about for uh, interacting with large language models. That is also something I've been using in my day job. And because of the niceties around being able to define effects, so you can use like patterns of abstractions that are simpler and much uh, more convenient uh, for large language models as well. Uh, if you saw the description of my talk, uh, I mentioned that I would be showing benchmarks, so I'm going to do that. Uh, last year, I avoided it because it's a contentious topic. People can get upset, but I'm a performance engineer. I've been optimizing Q, and I should be able to show my work, right? So um, I'm going to show some of the benchmarks. I built a summary that is basically I took each of the benchmarks uh, compared Q to the best contender. So there are a few implementations and then compared it. Uh, but all the results are also available uh, in this URL. And it's pretty cool because it's a mechanism that runs on GitHub and uh, publishes all the benchmarks and et cetera to these websites. I'm hoping to publish this mechanism as a separate project so other projects can reuse uh, this infrastructure for running uh, benchmarks. Uh, the targets in the benchmarks are Q. Uh, cat, cat effect, Zio, and Ox. But Ox has only a few of the benchmarks have Ox because first, it doesn't have all the features. And second, it's not clear to me it's a fair comparison yet, but I thought it was nice to have at least a comparison with Loom and how uh, Ox works as well. Yeah, the data, uh, if you go to the website, the link I have there, you're going to see throughput allocation data from JMH, but also you can click on the profiling view there and see all profiling sessions for all uh, benchmarks. And that's really cool because I love like looking 
performance data. So it's something I work uh, and use a lot during my day-to-day -day, uh, work on QO when I'm working on it. Uh, the environment for the execution of the benchmark is not my machine. Uh, it's GitHub large runners. It's also a dedicated machine. It's a paid feature. I got access recently uh, a few months back. Uh, that is a beta feature in GitHub. It has eight cores, uh, 32 gigs of memory, Ubuntu running, and all the source code for the benchmarks uh, is there. So I have a, this summary that is just the comparison of Q to the best contender on each of the benchmarks and then an average of those results. And on average, Kyo's throughput is 249% higher than the best contender on each of the benchmarks. And this is an average of the results of each of the benchmarks. Uh, I'm not going to show all the details of all benchmarks, but I want to highlight some interesting ones. Uh, this is a benchmark that came from Zio's code base. Something that I try to do to avoid bias in these benchmarks is trying to use, reuse benchmarks from other projects. So many of the benchmarks come from Zio's code base or Daniel's async benchmarks or um, even people suggesting things on Twitter. I just implemented benchmarks because it's a way of avoiding bias on how I'm testing uh, the, those frameworks. Uh, and this is a really cool one coming from Zio that is a broad flat map benchmark. It's just like a Fibonacci using effect systems. It doesn't make sense, right? But it's an interesting exercise for exercise for benchmarks. Um, and as you can see, there is uh, there. If you look at the results of the benchmarks, there are two groups: the fork uh, with the fork prefix, and then the sync prefix. That is basically the benchmark with fork is always going to ensure that there's a forking to a fiber before executing the benchmark, and the sync version is going to execute, try to execute in the same uh, threads of the main uh, JMH threads. Uh, and as you can see, the, the aux benchmark is basically just a regular playing Fibonacci. It's not really an actual effect system where it's just playing Scala Fibonacci. And Kyo is able to match that. And that's truly remarkable. It means that Kyo is able to get rid of its overheads at runtime. And that's because I designed the library having just time compilation in mind from the ground up, right? So from the very core to all trans all implementations, all thinking about performance and just time compilation. And this shows also on the uh, allocation charts. So as you can see, actually Kyo in the sync version in Ox as well has zero allocation. So the effect system disappears. And when I said that's maybe not a fair comparison is because in Ox, the codes is like becoming uh, allocation free and in Kyo as well. But in Ox, there is no preemption, for example, right? So, but a Kyo computation, even in this scenario, can be paused, can be preempted, preempted if necessary. So the effect system is still there. It's just like being optimized away. Um, if you look, notice the difference in the FARC version from Kyo and Ox, there is a difference as well. So Kyo is allocating 185 bytes per operation and FARC 13 and Ox 1300. So it's a big difference. And that's basically the difference between uh, fibers, lightweight fibers in Kyo and virtual threads in basically. Cool. And Kyo also has uh, high performance asynchronous primitives. Uh, if you see uh, other effect systems, they normally try to build some niceties and high level uh, APIs. In Kyo, I try to do the same, but all without compromising performance. So if you have something like a countdown, countdown latch in Kyo, it has very little overhead. So like it has much better throughput as well. And the reason, main reason uh, is also, again, low allocation rates. Um, Kyo's fibers are very lightweight. Uh, each fiber has a memory footprint of only 32 bytes, right? So uh, if you see a benchmark like this one, it's a benchmark where a fiber forks another, forks another. So it's basically chaining, forking. Uh, Kyo has a much better performance. Cat's effect actually performs well in this one. Uh, but for Ox, for example, has a uh, uh, really not good performance. And this is actually, I don't know, Java people normally say that fracturing pool is like pretty great performance. It's not really like, uh, has many problems in terms of performance. And that's actually the main reason for Ox bad uh, results here. Uh, and again, Kyo's allocation rate is just much lower. Uh, Kyo also has a channel implementation, also uh, good performance, uh, as you can see, like be better than the other uh, effect systems. Again, lower overheads. 
And I want to write more about the channel implementation because it's just like a new way of implementing channels that I haven't seen before. And it's very simple and at the same time has really good performance characteristics. Now I'm almost done. Uh, I imagine you are all tired, it's like a day of conference, so I'm almost done. Uh, I just wanted to address a question that might some of you might be thinking, right? So doesn't this look very similar to what Caprice is promising? And the answer, yes. QO delivers Caprice's key promises. But it does that without any language changes. And it does that with a complete set of effects. And it does that in Scala 2, Scala 3, and Scala JS. And it does that with next level performance. And it does that today. Right? So it's not five years from now. It's today you can go to the website and start using Kill. Uh, so yeah, that's all I had for today. Uh, I don't know if we have uh, we have time for questions, so uh, let me know. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for that uh, fantastic and really thought-provoking and stimulating talk. Uh, yeah, I think we've got a little bit of time here. So does anyone have any questions they'd like to ask? If you can raise your hand, I can bring the mic to you. At least one person here. Uh, yeah. yeah, please. Uh -huh. yeah, how easy would uh, Keo to be as a drop-in replacement for like CEO? Uh, this is drop in, re yeah, drop in replacement uh, if I wanted to so, replace it. Uh, I think uh, replacing is hard to, something hard to do because there is all the semantics. There are different semantics for operations that are not exactly the same. Q, Q is very inspired in Zio, but implementation is very different. So there are different semantics and different uh, executions. So just like a straightforward translation wouldn't be easy, but we are at the age of large language models, right? So I wouldn't uh, say that it's too hard to build something that's able to migrate uh, code in other effect systems to kill eventually. And that's something I've been working with large language models, so it's certainly something I'm going to be exploring as well. Very cool. Who else has questions they'd like to ask? All right, here we got one more. Thank you, amazing. Uh, uh, two, two questions. Uh, what about uh, interoperability with uh, other, other FX systems? And uh, what about streaming? Do you have some uh, idea on streaming too? Thank you. Yeah, so I initially had uh, implementation that would integrate with Zio. So you could use Kyo with Zio, but I actually found that there was some unsoundness in the way that I was doing that. Uh, but I do have plans. So in order to integrate with Zio, I would have to make fibers rely on Loom to eventually block in a few places. And that's something I'm, I'm actually planning to do. But then Kyo would actually depend on Java 21. That is probably a uh, reasonable requirement. Um, and then about, uh, and once I have that, it would be very easy, for example, to embed Kyo within a Zio computation and back and forth. Um, and regarding streaming, I actually started implementing streams a few times, but I've, I'm always like, I implement one time, a second time, third time, and I'm always searching like for the simplest way of implementing that. So I'm still not there, but uh, hopefully uh, streams are going to be supported. It's something I need for large language, large language models as well, because it's necessary to stream responses uh, for like a good user interface. So it's something I'm going to be exploring soon. Great. Any other questions before we break here? One more. Go for it. Uh, how big is the team who developed this? Sorry, can you repeat the question? The question was, how big is the team? I think the answer may be one. Yeah, one. <laughs> it's me. <laughs> but it's a, it's a long time. I've been working on this for a couple of years already. <laughs> All right, I see one more, and then I think we'll call it a night here. Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, uh, broadly, Grawl VM, uh, Scala Native, can you speak to that? Like, what uh, does this seem to, it seems to lend itself to uh, not only high-performance Scala on the JVM, but high-performance Scala elsewhere as well? 
Yeah, that's a great question. I don't have much experience working with Scala Native, for example, so that's why I haven't compiled. But I think because Kyo is basically pure Scala codes, I wouldn't think that there are many limitations, but uh, someone has to try. And uh, I'm releasing today. Uh, my hope is, OK, there might be users, but if there are people interested in collaborating, I'm very eager to help and uh, work together on these kind of solutions. And for GraalVM, I wouldn't expect any limitations um, because, again, just like playing calls, there isn't much that is like magical or specific. OK, awesome. Well, let's give a big round of applause to Avio here. Thank you so much for sharing with us. Thank you, folks.